Good morning, everyone. I shall read the word of the Lord from Colossians chapter 3, verse 14, which says, And above all these, put on love, which binds everything, everything together in perfect harmony. In addition, from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 8, which says, Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. And it is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. And this is the word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, go ahead and take your Bibles and turn, if you will, to the book of Philippians. That's where we are. We've started a new series, as I said earlier, and today we're going to uh, continue. We're hope hoping to cover verses 3 through 8 of this wonderful series. We're not trying to dictate to the Bible what we'll do or say or how far we'll go. We're letting the Bible speak. I'm trying to be mindful of how Paul wrote this beautiful letter and where he has given us uh, a sense of direction or a theme for that particular verse or verses. And so it just appears to me that chapter, or verse 3 through 8 flow together, and we'll be, be looking at that verse by verse. But last week, we began a new verse by verse study, and we read verses 1 and 2. We did an introduction. Let me read verses 1 and 2 to you. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, we took those two verses and broke them into three parts. Here are the three parts we looked at. The servants, the saints, and the salutation. Now today... We're going to continue in the opening of Paul's letter by looking at the components of joy. If you want to write that in your, in your little uh, uh, notebook that we passed out or on your own note section, uh, the, the components of joy. This whole series is about joy. Paul talks about joy in all four chapters, and while it's a small book or a small letter, uh, he is overly, jo overly joyed in the fact that he's in prison. I mean, I think about that. Who would be excited about being in prison? Yet we learned last week Paul was ministering to even Caesar's household and the jailers that, yeah, think about it. Here's Paul, who is a, he is the greatest missionary to ever live, in my opinion. Okay, Bible doesn't say that, but I think that's true. The greatest missionary that ever lived. Get this. This guy is like a hound dog to lost people. He sniffs them out. He finds them. And then he shares the gospel boldly with them. And so now he's in prison for sharing the gospel. The Jews hate him for pushing Jesus as Messiah. And so he's taken all the way to Rome from Jerusalem. And now he is in prison waiting his trial, waiting the outcome of his trial. And, and each day, he's got these soldiers that are literally chained to him. I'm not talking about him being in stocks. He's not in stocks. It's, it's a house arrest, but, it's, but he did have a soldier for like a four- to six-hour period who would be chained to him. And then he would unchain, and then he would, another soldier would chain to him. These guys, forget about Paul. They couldn't get away from Paul. He's chained. Oh, look who we have now. It's brother, you know, whoever the guy was. And man, he just lit into him about the gospel, loving him with the gospel, loving, learning about his life, learning about his family, learning about his background, 
finding out what kind of pagan religion he's participating in, and listening and loving and then sharing the gospel of Christ. This is Paul. This is, and, 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 and so in prison, Paul is overjoyed. And, and here in verses 3 through 8, he gives us the components of joy that will allow us in our own circumstances, in our own trials, in our own issues of life to remain joyful. And so we're going to be looking at that today. That's why we've titled the series, The Joy-Filled Life, okay? And it's my prayer that each of you, that no matter what you're facing in life at this time, you might be filled to the measure with God's enduring and unshakable joy. Joy is part of the believer's life at all times. And I'll bet there's not a single Christian in the room who can say yes to that because we let our hair down. The enemy attacks. The flesh rises. We lose our joy. But I'm just telling you what the Bible says about joy. The Bible says that we are to rejoice how often? And again, I say, rejoice. It is the life of the believer to live in such a place with mindfulness of the work of the Holy Spirit happening inside of you that you're able to look forward to the future with great joy, knowing God's will will be done and His will in your life is the best for you. Amen? So, when joy is understood in a biblical sense, it's always related to God. Let me just give you a quick review from last week, those who are not here. It's always related to God, okay? It, it, it's something that becomes yours in Christ Jesus. You've got to be saved to experience the kind of joy we're talking about today, okay? Uh, happiness isn't joy. The world experiences happiness, but what is happiness? In the root form, it's happenstance. It's chance. Basically, what we're saying is it's encounters and circumstances that are favorable that come to you. But they come and go like the wind. And you don't know when you're going to be happy. You can't plan for happy. It's just something you react to. That is not the joy of the Bible. Okay, joy is a deep, abiding confidence that I can carry with assurance in spite of the direction that the wind blows, the promise that all things are working together for God's good and for his glory. I can always know that to be true. Amen? Do any of you ever doubt that God is absolutely in control and has a plan and his plan is being carried out to perfection. You should not. He can do whatever he chooses to do, and what he chooses to do, he does. That sounded like Kamala Harris. I'm sorry. Um, I said a lot and didn't say a whole lot. Okay. All in the same sentence. Forgive me. Let me say it again. To know this kind of joy is to know Jesus Christ. The joy of the Lord is a byproduct of a deep, abiding relationship with Jesus. You will not experience the joy of the Lord as a believer if you don't have an intimate relationship with Jesus, if you're not leaning into him. What I mean by that is, as believers, we have a choice every day, throughout the day. What are we going to lean into? Are you going to lean into your money? Are you going to lean into your job? Are you going to lean into your title? Are you going to lean into your friends? Are you going to lean into your reputation in the community? Or are you going to lean into Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith, the one who gives you the only title that really matters? He gives you an identity founded in him. And when you have that and you're reminded of that through the day and you don't lean into other stuff but you lean into him, you will have joy. That is not a hope. That's a promise in the Word of God. That's what all of us ought to be looking for. You want to unlock the key to the joy-filled life? Start spending more time with the Lord. Give God more time. Pray more. Be in His Word more. 
Uh, you know what I do through the week? I'm just telling you out of my own life, okay, here's what I do. I do like music, and I like a lot of different kinds of music. So I listen to all some weird stuff. You guys would be like, what? But I do. I, I, I just like music. But I got to tell you, every single day I go to Pandora on my app, Pandora app, and I put in Christian music, a radio. It's, there's one in particular that I really like. Uh, that's the Getty uh, radio, uh, Kristen and Keith Getty uh, radio. And I listen because they write hymns and they write songs. And the people that they associate with who are also writers of songs, these songs are rich in truth and knowledge of God. A lot of songs, if you're listening to the radio, Christian radio songs and that's all you have, I'm just going to tell you, you're walking in shallow water. They sound cool. The lyrics line up and match. Some of the lyrics aren't even biblical. Bad theology. Other uh, aspects of it, it's just weak theology. You need worship music that moves your mind to think about God, and that triggers your emotion to get involved. So I'm cruising down the road in my Tacoma, and I've got some good, hearty worship music on, and I'm telling you, it's as good as Sunday morning church. I'll start tearing up. I'll start shouting in my truck. I don't even have a dog in the truck to shout to. It's me alone with God. I get excited. Joy comes over me. I don't care what I'm facing in life. I don't care what physical issues or what other matters are going on. I'm taken up into a different place with the Lord. I'm, he's my focus. We need that. You need that in your life every day. And, and then I also listen, I have favorite preachers, guys that I, and my preachers that I like to listen to are more teachers than preachers. I know a lot of you like good preachers. I like, he's a good preacher. Okay, uh, yeah, that's like, okay, so you're talking dessert. You like desserts. I like good veggies and I like good meat and potatoes, okay? Give me the stuff that's going to really give me nutrients that I need in my body, okay? So I'm looking for Bible teachers who really expound upon and exegete the text of the Word of God. I can put that on, man, and I'm telling you right now. Woo! I love traveling. I go down uh, for three weeks, three times a week, I drove down to Palm Beach Gardens to see Dr. Seema, who is my... Um, well, he's a chiropractor, but he's much more than a chiropractor, and he's a specialist in understanding blood and heritage of who you, where you came from and knowing how to build for you the right diet and knowing how to give you the right exercises and stretching and then treating the body. Uh, I saw miraculous results in the first month of going to him. But three times a week, I'm driving down and back. Man, I heard a lot of good preaching. I heard a lot of good worship. It was awesome. When you got a trip, don't don't fret the trip. Don't uh, you got to travel in the car for two and a half hours? Two and a half hours with the Lord. Where's the amens, Tom? Thank you, thank you. One guy in the whole place gets it. Okay, we haven't even started the sermon yet, so we probably won't get all the way through it. But that's okay. Verse three, let's start it up. Okay. Let's press into the next few verses and identify the components of joy. He said, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you, uh, for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all. Because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. There's a lot in those verses. Let's unpack it. True joy is produced by the presence of God and His Spirit in the life of the believer. Here, Paul is sitting in prison waiting for possible news, listen, about an execution. He doesn't know what's going to come out of this imprisonment. 
And he just wrote what I read from that prison, not knowing his physical future. Let that just sink in. This is a man, a true believer, who will not allow life circumstances to rob him of his joy. As we come to verse 3 through 8, his joy spills out in such a beautiful way. And he shares with us five, if I can give them to you. Well, there's several. We'll try to cover five, but maybe we'll only get four in, and that's okay, of the components of joy. First, there's the joy of remembrance. Write that down, the joy of remembrance. And then there's the joy of intercession. And then there's the joy of participation. There's the joy of anticipation and the joy of affection. Let me cover those again for you if you're writing them because I gave them kind of quickly. Remembrance, the joy of remembrance, the joy of intercession, the joy of participation, the joy of anticipation, and the joy of affection. Each of these components of joy are produced solely by the Holy Spirit. You in yourself cannot, you cannot conjure up, rally up these joys, these components of joy. They happen within the believer. They don't happen from outside. It's not about experiences that you have, that these, all of a sudden you had this incredible experience, something happened, and now, man, you're just overwhelmed with one of these joys. No, no. These five joys start inside of you, and it's only by the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, let's look at verse at, uh at verse 3, and we're going to look at the first uh, component of joy, the joy of remembrance. Verse 3, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. So the very thought of the Philippians brought Paul into this jubilant celebration. All churches fall short. All Christians fall short. Nothing was different in Paul's experience with the church and with the Christians in Philippi. But that's not his focus. His focus is the joy that he has for them as he remembers them. He's not focusing on remembering the idiosyncrasies, the shortcomings, the fleshly moments. Paul is choosing to focus upon what the Holy Spirit is bringing to his mind. And that is the preciousness of these saints that he's in fellowship with. And the, the stories that come up in his mind of his first experience, his first encounter with those who lived in Philippi. Every memory that he brings up is a cause for delight. And what blessed memories they were. Paul must have remembered that Sabbath day when he came to Philippi and he was looking for a synagogue, but there wasn't one because you have to have 10 Jewish men living in the city before you can build a synagogue. So there weren't even 10 Jewish men. So he knew that the Jews that would be in that town, probably mostly women, they would gather at the river's edge. That was a common practice among those who were, who were practicing Judaism in pagan lands. Philippi is a far cry from Jerusalem, believe me. So he made his way down to the river, and there at the riverside, he saw a few Jewish women who were worshiping the true God in the only way they knew how, through Judaism, okay? And there the Lord opened the heart of a woman named Lydia. She was a very special lady. She was a woman who was very successful in the business world. She sold very fine garments, and she was also an activator. She was an administrative type. She could get things going, and he meets her there, and it says that the Lord called her. The Lord opened her eyes as Paul began to share the gospel, giving the full understanding of where Judaism stops and through the law, and where Christ continues. 
because he is the fulfillment of the law. He's the continuation of the law. Her eyes were opened. And that woman on that day was saved. By the way, Lydia was the first convert in Europe. The very first convert in Europe. But it wasn't just Lydia. That same day, it says her household was saved. Now, Lydia, we find out later, was a single woman. So it's not referring to her children or her husband. It's referring to her servants and those who lived in her home. Even her servants were saved on that day. This is one of the memories, I'm sure, that Paul is remembering. And, and then what about the memory of, of the, the girl who was demon-possessed, and Paul prays, and she's released from the demon, and she too comes to the church. She gets saved. This little fledgling church of people who were lost, and God saved them. And, and what about the the, 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 the prison experience. Remember that when Paul and Silas are taken captive and thrown in prison in Philippi for preaching the gospel? They're beaten so much. They, they literally would take the shirt down or the, the, the upper clothing, take it, the garment would come down, and they would flog, they would beat them. And the, the flesh would be a pulp on the back. Now, we don't know to what degree Paul and Silas were beaten, but they, we know that they were probably flogged. That's the traditional thing to happen. And yet, at the midnight hour, what are they doing? They're chained, lock, lock and chain, okay, to these stocks. And yet, they are giving praise to God. They're singing songs of thanksgiving to God while they're suffering. That is, that's crazy. That's crazy thoughts. Who in this world, while they're suffering, would be giving joy and praise and thanksgiving to God? Only those who have leaned into the work of the Holy Spirit inside of them. And so, here they are worshiping God, and immediately God sends an earthquake, and it breaks the stocks, it breaks the chains and not just of Paul and Silas, but of all the prisoners in the prison. This is a dungeon, a cavern that they're being kept in. And all the prisoners were released. And immediately the, the jailer is like, no, no, they're going to leave. And he knew that according to Rome, if I lose these guys, my head, it's my head. I die. And Paul immediately softened him and said, hey, oh, no, 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 nobody's going to leave. We're all still here. As the dust would settle, you know, he's thinking they're all gone. The dust settles. He sees them all. And Paul said, let me share something with you, what just happened. Shared the gospel. That jailer and his whole household were saved that night. Is that not awesome? What a great memory. In times of trial, yet wonderful memories of joy. So my question to you right now in this moment is, what trial are you facing? What setback is before you? What physical issue are you having to deal with? Have you found moments of joy in the midst of it? And if not, why not? Because that joy in you is always available. All you have to do is lean into the Holy Spirit, and he'll give you joy again. That's why we can come in. It almost was to a person who's going through a ton of difficulty. You come in and these people are just singing these joyful songs and you're thinking, they are so insensitive to the people that are here that are suffering. It's just so insensitive. Don't they know that there's not everybody's joyful? Some of us are going through really hard times. Well, the reason we can celebrate and have joyful songs is because joy transcends the pain. It transcends the setback. Amen? This is what Paul lived. This is what he experienced. And now he's remembering this. Listen, church, one of the keys to a joy-filled life is being, being able to recall the goodness of God that you see happening as you minister to people. When we see people around us who are not bowing down to worldly belief systems, 
who are, not, who are, who are growing in Christ, people uh, who are being challenged to grow in Christ. I, at least three times this week, I don't know the exact number, at least three times in talking with people who were suffering, I said to them, as I let them share, I wanted to hear it because I want to pray for them. But I said, now, let me ask you a question, because they were believers, all three were believers. I said, let me ask you a question. What's God doing in that? What's God teaching you in that? How are you growing in this time? For two of the three, it hadn't even crossed their mind. They were so, in, so engulfed in the pain, in the sorrow, in the, in the hurt, in the wound. And all of a sudden, it's like they snapped. I was like, was, I didn't do this, but it was like I went, whap, snap out of it. No, I didn't do it like that. I just, what is God teaching you right now through all this? And one of them was able to say, here's what he's teaching me. The other two, um, what do you mean? And so then I went to my own life, and I said, well, I've been suffering for three months with, with physical issues, and they still don't have it all figured out. But I'm telling you right now, I'm finding joy in the journey. It's joyful. I'm thankful. And I'm thankful for the people that God's put in my life who are praying for me. And I'm thankful for the people that I get to minister to. And I'm thankful for the changes I'm seeing in people while they suffer. It's all good. God's at work. Amen? Well, that's number one. Let's go to number two. We've got to pick it up our pace a little bit. Joy of intercession. Look at verse four. Always in every prayer of mine for, for you all, making my prayer with joy. So the first thing he tells us is he, he likes to pray. Secondly, he likes to pray for, for others. And thirdly, it brings joy when he prays for others. Maybe the reason some of us aren't praying is because we're not seeing any joy in prayer. And maybe the reason we're not seeing joy in prayer, I'm, this is just a thought, consider it, okay? Not an indictment, it's a thought. Although you might wear it well, only the Spirit will tell you. Is it possible that the reason there's no joy in your prayer is because your prayer isn't intercession for others? Your prayer is, pre is dominated by self-focus. You've got this laundry list. You've got this public shopping list of all the needs in your life, all the pains, all the things that are not going the way you want. And you get into prayer, and that's all you focus on. Well, no wonder you don't have joy. You got your eyes on your problem. Remember I said last week, stop looking out, stop looking in, look up. Lift your eyes to God. Get the right picture of God. And all of a sudden you find that whatever problems you're facing, I don't care if it's cancer, whatever problem you're facing is nothing compared to the greatness of your God. And maybe that's why we don't have joy. Paul said, I'm finding joy as I pray for others. That's where the joy comes in. This is a component of joy that you never want to miss. The delight of praying for others. And yet so few Christians do it. I would say that if you're struggling to rejoice over others and the work that God is doing in them, then this component will help you recover your joy. Because what will happen when you start praying for others and interceding in their behalf, you stop looking at their problems and their idiosyncrasies and their shortcomings, and you start looking at what? God at work in them, just like he's at work in me. I've got problems too. I'm not a completed picture yet. That won't happen till I get to heaven. And so just as God is working in me constantly using my pains and my setbacks, God's doing the same in them. Intercede for that. Thank you, Lord, that you're at work in them. I can't see it yet. That doesn't matter. You're at work. Because that's a promise from the Word of God for a believer, that you're going to bring them through a process of sanctification until they are glorified in heaven. So prayer is the way of a believer who has allowed the Spirit to control his or her life. Paul was not only a prisoner in Rome, by the way. At the same time that he's writing this, there are those preachers and teachers and, and Christian leaders who had risen up against him. They were giving all these false reasons why Paul was in prison. They didn't see it as simply as Paul is being faithful to the word of God and Rome and Jews didn't like it. They handed him over to the Romans. Now the Romans want to do an investigation. 
They didn't see it that way. They were in opposition. These are believers. And so Paul's got that on him too. But do you see anything? In, now later he'll talk about it. But never does it still his joy, even when there's Christians that are against him, that are in opposition to him. We, we, somebody looks at us the wrong way. You're in church. They walk by. They don't say hi. And man, it just messes you up. You get sideways just because somebody didn't acknowledge you. Now, let's just break that down. What's that really about? If you had been praying that morning, interceding on behalf of people, do you think that you would have reacted that way? What that's about is you. It's selfish. It's pride. It's ego. It's arrogance. They didn't acknowledge me. They walked by like I'm not even here. Maybe the Lord had him walk by and not, not speak because he's trying to teach you something. See, I do that all the time, by the way, and I get in trouble all the time because I, like, sometimes, I mean, I like to stop and talk to people, and I do a lot here. I, I just enjoy that. Uh, for 30 minutes here, I was in the back talking to different people and just enjoyed every moment. And then finally I realized, hey, you got to preach a sermon. You better sit down for a little while. So I came and sat down front here, and people would walk up and we were talking. But... But oftentimes when I'm, I'm just walking by, I didn't even notice. It's not like I, I intentionally didn't want to speak to you. I'm just walking by. And somebody will say to me in an email, you walked by and didn't even acknowledge me. You, you didn't even speak to me. You're speaking more about you than me. And I hope you can see that. I hope the Holy Spirit can show you. When you pray for others and you intercede in their behalf, it changes your heart so that when you come to church, you're just wanting to fellowship and you're not waiting back there like this. Who's going to talk to me? Your arms are out and open and you're just walking by talking to people. You're not focused on who walked by and didn't say hi. It means nothing. They weren't trying to, to, to not speak to you. That's just a simple, practical way of seeing the power of intercession in the believer's life, how it changes who we are as we go to church on Sunday. So interceding, it's very important. I, I like chapter 4, Philippians 4, verses 8 and 9. Listen to what Paul said. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence... If there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Stop thinking about the stuff that makes gossip. Stop thinking about the, the bitterness, the hurts, the wounds. Whatsoever things are just and pure and honorable and true and lovely and commendable, focus on those things. Amen? Bible says, as a man thinketh, so is he. If all you think about is the negative, you're a negative person. You're probably a toxic person. And then people will avoid you. But you know what? Christians shouldn't. When God really has our hearts, it even compels us to go to the people that are difficult to talk with or difficult to relate to. We still go to them. Why? Because God's doing a work in us. He's changed how we see them. And we stop judging them and critiquing them for the, the fact that they're not like us. And we just start relating how God had to change me too. And so I need to give some, some, some leverage here, some flexibility. Let the Spirit do His work in them. I just need to love them. I don't need to judge them. I think that's important. Joy is, fo is God-focused. And the opposite of joy is bitterness and resentment and, and, and unforgiveness. That's all self focus Get your eyes off that stuff. Number three, the joy of participation. I thank my God in all remembrance of you. This is verse three. Always in prayer of mine for you, all making my prayer with joy. And here it is, verse five. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Now that word partnership is the word koinonia in the Greek. And it means fellowship. But not just fellowship in general. You could fellowship over you know, a ball game. That's not what it's, it's saying, fellowship in the gospel. I have in common with those who are saved. Therefore, I'm going to spend time with them. I'm going to fellowship with them. He says this, uh, 
he said, I, I think it's interesting. He said, uh, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. So what first day is he referring to? He's, re he's speaking to the church in Philippi. He's speaking of salvation. When they first got saved, he's remembering back to when they first got saved. And he's basically telling them, we have from that moment forward been in partnership. We're growing together. So the person whom the Spirit of God is free to produce joy will rejoice in the fellowship of believers. He'll, he, he'll, be, he'll be a loving Christian to other Christians. He will have a heart that lovingly reaches out and says, I want, I want to bless you for your participation in the gospel. You've remained faithful, and I just need to encourage you in that. I, I saw Steve Wade uh, this week. We were uh, just, just ran into each other. We were in the same spot at the same time in town. And he encouraged me. He encouraged me. And he shared how he's encouraged, even in the fellowship and what God's doing. You know, it's interesting to me how encouragement is putting courage into someone. Make it a regular habit to put courage into people. I, I met with Thomas this week, and we were talking, and I said, Thomas, I, here's a wonderful way to open the door for, for effective prayer of others. And I said, so when you're in a hospital visiting someone, or it's a friend, and you ran into them at Publix, uh, and, and, uh, and you ask, how are you doing? And they share, you know, the good and maybe the not so good. And that's all, that's all, you want to hear it because you need to hear it. So you know how to pray. But then, before I pray, I'll always say, how would you like me to pray for you? Let me tell you, that's a game changer. Don't just assume, based on what they just told you, that you know how to pray for them. Ask them, how would you like me to pray for you? And after I ask that, I don't try to come back with something quick because it's awkward for them. I don't do that. I just, I, I wait. I give them a few seconds. And most people take a few seconds. They don't give a quick response. And then they will respond. And they'll say, you know, if you could pray for me this way. And many times, it's totally different than what they just shared with me happening in their life. I'll never for, forget meeting with a, a lady named Samantha in the hospital. We called her Sam. And uh, she was having a procedure. And I said, and I, you know, she's having a procedure. Come on, Greg, you know how to pray for her. And I said, uh, Samantha, how would you like me to pray for you? And her response was quiet. She was thinking. She was contemplating. And then she said, I'm not sure that I'm saved. Had nothing to do with the reason she was in the hospital. And it opened the door for me to share with her what it looks like to be saved, what it means to be saved, how we're saved. She got saved in the hospital bed that day. Had I not asked that question, I would have gone right into ministering to her. See, our prayer with others, this joyful participation, when you can really care enough, koinonia, with those that have the gospel in common with you, and you minister the gospel, but you do it knowing that prayer is going to be part of this ministry. I am going to take time to pray with you. That's so important. So important. Number four, let's go ahead and move forward. Number four, the joy of anticipation. And I am, verse six, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. That is a, thank you so much, Thomas. Appreciate that. That is a loaded, loaded passage. And that's one that all of us have probably heard a thousand times. And maybe you even quote it from time to time. So let me tell you what it's meant to say, what, what the meaning is, so that you don't use that verse for the wrong reason or the wrong way. And many people do. 
He says, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So Paul says, I'm sure, I'm confident. The verb pietho means to be persuaded, to be sure, to be absolutely convinced. And that's what Paul is saying. I am absolutely convinced of this very thing. What is that thing? That he, he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. The point Paul's making here is that he's convinced. So what, what, is, what exactly is uh, the, the work that he began, that God began? Salvation. He's speaking to the people that he went and he led to Christ. They got saved from the first day of their salvation. God's going to complete in you his work. Let me say this to you about salvation. Salvation is an event. I want you to hear this. Salvation is an event. It happens once. It's an event where God has opened the your eyes to see the truth of the gospel. He's calling you. And he's given you faith to believe so that on that day, you have, you have repented of your sin and you've believed in Jesus as the Son of God who died for you. That's an event. What happens in the life of the believer every single day after that event of salvation until the day that you're called home in Christ Jesus is called sanctification. So salvation is an event. Now that the event has happened and the Holy Spirit, when you are saved, the Holy Spirit moves in. Okay? That's a promise. That's not Greg trying to give you an idea. This is what I think. It says that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. He dwells within. It's a promise. In fact, why does he dwell in? Number one, as a pledge to you that you will one day be in heaven. It's like a down payment. God says, I'm going to put the Spirit in you just so you know that you're my child now. So salvation occurs as an event, and then every day after, I'm in a continual process of being sanctified. Write this down. Let me give you a simple one-sentence definition for sanctification, okay? And it's a biblical definition. Sanctification is the process, we might even say ongoing process, where I am being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, period. Sanctification is an ongoing process whereby I am being conformed to the image of Jesus. And it happens every hour of every day. The Holy Spirit is the hound of heaven, and he is out. Not, not, he's not trying to save you now. He just wants to complete in you the work that God started or began when you got saved. So now let's look at that passage again. I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you, salvation, will bring it to completion, will bring it, future tense, it's going to continue to happen, sanctification, at the day of Jesus Christ. When the day that Christ returns, the day that you're called up to heaven and you now, listen, at that time, you enter glorification. Sanctification stops. You don't have to grow in heaven. You're done. You went from an event that saved you into a life of being conformed to the image of Jesus and then the presence of Jesus. That's a life worth living, amen? Wow. And in Galatians 3.3, 3, it says, Paul said, are you so foolish having begun by the Spirit? Are you now being perfected by the flesh? In other words, so Paul's saying, you, you were begun by the Spirit. See, he's, he's saying it starts with salvation when the Spirit regenerates you into a new person. Paul's pointing the Christians in Galatia back to their salvation, which began in them when they were saved. 
So it always references salvation here in Philippians. Don't take it out of context. The work that God began in you, he's going to bring to completion. And you know, the Lord had me go out and I'm building this ministry and we're going to see people come to Jesus. And so I know that the Bible says the promise of God is that he's going to bring it to completion. Wrong! You just took that verse out of context. You committed eisegesis. You put into the text what's not there. You want to exegete the text, take out, exit what is in the Bible. And the, it's talking about salvation, nothing else. Very important we understand that. Number five, ready to go to number five, last one? Here we go. The joy of affection. The joy of affection. It is right for me, verse seven, it is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers with me of the grace of both in the imprisonment and in the defense of the gospel. And then he says in verse 8, For God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. So twice he talks about feeling here, what's in his heart, and he talks about affection for them. So what Paul is really trying to say to us here is that This is not something that I'm having to work hard so that I care about you and I pray for you. Because the Spirit of God has Paul consumed with love, the love of God, it overflows Paul into those that he ministers to. And now he carries inside of him, in his heart, a deep abiding affection for other people. Oh, how I pray that that be the case for Vero Bible Fellowship. That we would build in our hearts a deep abiding affection for one another. That we would be about that. That that's what we would be about. Loving one another, caring for one another, listening to one another, praying for one another. That alone is reason to come earlier on Sunday. And it certainly is reason for us to call on people during the week and check on them. How are you doing? See, we get so caught up in our world, which carries us away from the joy. But when we take time to let the Spirit speak, and then He puts a face or a name on our mind, and we call them, hey, just thinking about you. How how are you doing? And listen And care enough and say, hey, I'm going to pray for you right now. I'm going to get off this phone. or If it's on the phone, pray with them. But if it's a text, I'm going to be praying for you. And mean it. Now you just took your eyes off of you and you put it on others. And now all of a sudden joy fills you. There's no joy like that of ministry to others. Amen? Well, let's close our time. I want to say to you today, if there's anyone here who... who has heard today that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he was made incarnate, meaning he took on flesh and blood, while he still was fully God, he was fully man. And he took on our sins and went to the cross because we could never pay the penalty for our sins before a holy God. And he took my sins on the cross and Jesus bore them And because of that, he suffered greatly at the hands of Almighty God. And the Bible says that God was pleased to break him. He was pleased to crush him for our sake. And Jesus, listen, when he was fully man, he didn't want to do it. He did not want to go to the cross in his flesh. He said to the Father, if there's any way possible, let this cup pass from me. I don't, but, but he, he rested in God's plan and said, but not my will, thine be done. And he took on our suffering and our pain. He died for us. If you're here and you're not a believer, You've never believed what I just said. That's the gospel. That's part of the gospel. 
The other part is three days later, after God put Jesus through excruciating pain and judgment and death, three days later, that same heavenly Father raised him from the dead because his payment for our sins was enough. If you are ready to surrender your life to Jesus, you're ready to begin a process of leaning into God so that you're conformed to the image of Jesus. Salvation is the event that needs to happen first. Only after that will the Spirit live in you. I want you to just, from your own heart, from your own mind, communicate to God. Father, I now get it. I can sense that in this moment you are coming after me. You're calling me to salvation. I'm overwhelmed by that. And I tell you that I confess my sin and I need the salvation that the Lord brings. Otherwise, I don't have a chance before you. And I want the confidence and assurance of my salvation and my eternal home in heaven. Just surrender to him. Listen, quicker than that, you're saved. The Holy Spirit takes up, re takes up residence, and you're a new creature in Christ. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. You don't have to raise a hand. You don't have to walk an aisle. You don't have to pray a prayer. It happens inside of you as you come into the full knowledge of the gospel, and you surrender to it. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for the privilege of prayer. We thank you for the privilege of of sharing in the ministry and in the lives of other believers. Sometimes we take that for granted. Other times, Lord, it causes people to leave a church because they get so whacked out and, and, and messed up by the fact that people aren't perfect. Well, they aren't either. But God, you are perfect. And you have designed your church to be a work in progress. Everybody here is in the process of being conformed to the image of Jesus. Sometimes we let the flesh speak out and sometimes we follow the Spirit. But Lord, when the flesh speaks, the Spirit convicts. And when the Spirit convicts, we humble up, eat humble pie, and get back on track so that we can be conformed. I pray that everybody here would understand there's nobody that's ready-made here. Nobody's perfect. Nobody. You are the only perfect one to live on this earth. And you're calling us to be real, to be honest, and you're calling on us to lean into you and to be in fellowship, in koinonia, with others who have received the gospel. May it happen at Vero Bible Fellowship in a strong and rich way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you need prayer, our elders and prayer partners will be up front. Come up and they'll, they'll pray with you about any matter in your life. And uh, God bless each of you today. Make sure you take time to fellowship. God bless.